South America's biggest economy. It's the continent's most powerful country, one that thought it was rid of a history of violent military coups. But now, Brazil's democratically elected president Dilma Rousseff says that she's the victim of a political coup. After Congress Sunday night voted overwhelmingly to send impeachment proceedings against her to the Senate. Dilma's supporters reacted to the vote with shock and sadness, while her enemies and anti-government protesters celebrated. But what has she done? presided over the worst recession in nearly a century, allegedly used creative accounting to conceal the hole in her budget, tried to hire her predecessor, perhaps to shield him from criminal investigation. But are these impeachable offenses? She herself has not been tainted by or even accused of corruption, and she refuses to resign. Those who call me to resign show the fragility of their conviction of the process of impeachment, because above all, they are trying to instate a coup d'etat against our democracy. I can assure you that I will not cooperate with this. I will not resign for any reason whatsoever. So, what is at the core of this political drama that's led to anger and frustration online and on the streets? Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter Glenn Greenwald lives in Brazil and he's closely covering this constitutional crisis. He joined me from Rio. Welcome back to the program, Glenn. Great to be with you. So were you surprised? Did, did, did anybody really think that at the last moment she could have got the votes she needed to stave off this sort of impeachment process? I don't think the outcome was particularly surprising. I think that the margin was was fairly surprising, although Brazilian politics, like in a lot of other countries, is is about momentum and power. And once there was a perception that they had the votes, a lot of last minute undecided switched to the pro impeachment side um, so that they can be on the winning side. I think what did surprise people, though, was the tenor of uh, the proceedings in the House. It was extremely raucous, very ugly. You had pro-impeachment uh, advocates standing up and hailing the 1964 coup and the right-wing military dictatorship that followed. One prominent right-wing uh, congressman who's expected to run for president specifically praised the chief torturer of the military regime who, of course, tortured Dilma Rousseff, the president, before then voting to impeach her. So it kind of was a, a very polarized and, and a very um, ugly tenor uh, to these proceedings that reflects this wider sentiment in Brazil that really has split the country in, in a very dangerous and unstable way. Even the, the vice president who may have to step in is himself accused of all sorts of misconduct and wrong, wrongdoing. And I just want to read this to you because it is extraordinary. Of the 594 Congress members, 352 face accusations of criminal wrongdoing, according to multiple reports. And then, of course, there are all sorts of people, including, uh, including Eduardo Cunha, who's leading the impeachment process, who's accused of perjury and corruption. You've got another one, Malouf, who's on Interpol's red list for conspiracy. You've got another one accused of money laundering. You've got another one, as you just mentioned, you know, who, who is sort of implicated in all sorts of torture. And others, you know, impl in implicated in human rights violations. Now, Dilma herself has called this a coup. What is going on? It's the most extraordinary thing, Christian, because not only is essentially the entire Brazilian political class that is trying to impeach her implicated in really serious corruption. I mean, the most surreal thing I have ever seen in my time as a journalist or anywhere else covering politics in countries was that yesterday the person presiding over the impeachment proceeding in the House, the Speaker of the House, Eduardo Cunha, whom you referenced, he is somebody who was found to have stashed away millions of dollars in bribes. There's no non-corrupt possibility. He has no wealth. He has no businesses. Millions of dollars stashed away in Swiss bank accounts. Um, he's somebody who's presiding over the House as they're all getting up one by one, all of them accused of corruption and saying, we must remove the president for corruption. And amazingly, Dilma herself is one of the few people not accused of any kind of bribery or personal corruption or kickbacks or anything to be enriched. What's going on is pretty simple. Her party, the, the, the Workers' Party, or the PT, has won four straight 
national elections, going all the way back to Lula, who was wildly popular, who was first elected in 2006 and then re-elected in, in 2002 and then re-elected in 2006. The plutocrats in Brazil, the rich in Brazil, have long hated PT, have not been able to defeat them at the ballot box. Um, and so this is their big chance with the economy tanking, with this crisis proliferating, um, with people really upset with the government and the political class. This is their big chance to finally get rid of PT, which they cannot win in an, in an election. And so they're using these anti-democratic means to do it. And it's incredibly blatant what's taking place. Do you think, because even her supporters, certainly abroad, believe that when she tried to hire Lula, her predecessor, as chief of staff, they thought this was a step too far, that she was trying to shield him from any criminal probes uh, and obviously help her in some way. Some have said that she should resign, even though she may not be impeachable or these things that she's accused of don't rise to the level of impeachable offenses. Do you think that she should resign? Will she be forced to resign? I don't think she, I mean, no, I don't think she will be forced to resign. She's been very clear that she won't. This is a woman who was put into prison as a dissident during the dictatorship and who was tortured. Um, she's a very strong and, and willful woman um, who has been through a lot in her life. Um, and remember, the election in Brazil was only 18 months ago. It was at the end of 2014. She won that election with 54 million votes. Um, it is true that she's unpopular. She's made a lot of missteps. Um, that, that effort to get Lula into the government, um, which is really a survival, a last minute survival, um, tactic by her to get somebody with incredible political charisma and a lot of political skill that she lacks, Lula, into government to try and save her, was not a, didn't have a very good look. Um, but at the same time, you cannot go around if you want to have a mature democracy, a mature, stable democracy, and remove democratically elected leaders who just won a major election 18 months earlier because they're unpopular or because they're not managing the economy well. That is a recipe for some really dangerous things when you start tinkering with the mechanics of democracy, especially in a country like Brazil, which has a very fragile and a very young democracy. They came out of dictatorship only in 1985, and it's really disturbing to watch them trifling with democracy this way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've talked about how the whole system is, is full of political scandals and corruption, and you've also admitted that her party is sort of deeply corrupt and awash in its own sort of, you know, criminal wrongdoings, even though she's not, not touched. So I wonder, you know, what you, you know, what's the way out of that, but particularly in light of what this professor at um, the Sao Paulo University has told the New York Times about what's going on now. It's putting a very large bullet in Brazilian democracy, he says. From now on, any moment that we have a highly unpopular president, there'll be pressure to start an impeachment process. Right. I mean, it's interesting um, because I, I interviewed um, the former president, Lula, last week in, in Sao Paulo. And he admitted two things to me in that interview. He said, number one, it is true that his party, the PT party, which is Dilma's party as well, has a very serious problem with corruption, just like most of the other parties. And that number two, there's, there's this major investigation that's called Lava Jato or, or car wash in English, in which these really aggressive young prosecutors have asserted judicial independence and have been aggressively putting people in prison, the richest people in Brazil, the most politically powerful people in Brazil. The solution is to let that investigation unfold and let the people who are guilty be put in prison. The concern is that their intention with, with impeaching Dilma is to say to the country, look, we got rid of the corruption problem. The media pressure, the public pressure, they hope will dissipate now that there's this catharsis over impeachment and that this investigation will end and all of these truly corrupt politicians will be protected. Um, so the solution to answer your question is to let this investigation unfold, take everybody who's corrupt in all of the opposition parties and in PT, of which there are many, and uh, subject them to the rule of law and to accountability and put them in prison as was going to happen prior to the impeachment of Dilma. An incredible story. Glenn Greenwald, thanks for joining us from Rio de Janeiro tonight. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me.